everyone knows what an old growth forest is, or at least you've heard of it. But what is an old growth forest really? And why are they so, so important? Today, we're back here on Wes's property. And we're gonna answer those questions. We're gonna show you the organisms that thrive in this ecosystem and nowhere else. Come with us as we explore the old growth forests of Wes's property. Look at that beautiful wild strawberry. It's a very plant. And you can see there are some parts, you know, the seeds on the outside that are reminiscent of the strawberries we have today, but nothing else is, especially the flavor. That's actually spectacular. Mm. Jordan, you want to try one of these? Yeah. A goose poop on it, right? Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, you remembered our foraging episode. You always gotta be very careful about the things that you eat. Fortunately, on this property, we have no pesticides. Wes takes great care of his land. It's all very, very natural around here. Uh, but there are geese, so you gotta watch out for that goose. <laughs> so right here, we have a sassafras tree. This is sassafras albedia. And they're absolutely fascinating. So the leaves, the bark, and the roots we're actually one of the first exports from North America to Europe, going back all the way to the 1500s. It was considered kind of a cure-all for fever, other ailments. They thought it was a treatment for syphilis, which it is not. Chris, come over here, try this out. All right, you ready? All right. <gasps> Sniff. Uh, yeah, I think it smells like Citrusy. I always describe it as Fruit Loops. It smells like Fruit Loops to me. Hold this, don't crush it. Okay, okay, okay. Hold this, don't crush it. Oh wow, they're different. Uh-huh, and oh, hold this, don't crush it. Wait, wait, wait. So the sassafras is fascinating in that it can express with three distinct leaf shapes. And there are very few trees in the entire world that can do this. This was really, really exciting to botanists exploring North America. And that smell, go ahead and crush one of these. Crush them. Man, that is good. Now, so the leaves contain saffron, which smells great uh, and was used in the production of root beer, but it's actually a carcinogen, so don't eat too much of that. There you go, all right. Yeah, in the 1960s, they took saffron out of root beer because they figured it out that it was a carcinogen. Yeah, and that's what enticed early explorers, and that's what it enticed the Cherokee, the Osage, Mississippian peoples for generations. Yeah, Wes just pulled out a water spider. Take a look at this guy. He's got the, he's a huge spider for the area. He's got these long legs to spread out his surface tension so that he's able to move and glide across the surface of the water. And Wes has actually seen these guys dive. And they're able to do that because their body is covered in these very small hairs. And those hairs are actually able to trap air. Look at this. They create this sheath around them and they're able to dive underwater and search for prey down there. Larger water spiders have actually been seen to catch small fish. And look at how it just effortlessly glides across the surface of the water, using physics to its advantage. Now, in a lot of situations, uh, this would actually be kind of a dangerous behavior for the spider. That is an obvious target for an animal like a bass that will come up and strike and eat it. But here in this pool, he has absolutely nothing to worry about. And because this is an untreated pool with just spring-fed water, he's completely safe from those toxins as well. Wow, that's a pretty creature. And spiders are actually spectacular mothers. There's another one right here in a hole in the ground covered in all of its little babies. So they actually create these structures out of an adhesion mixture of mud and their own saliva. And so they build these chimneys a lot like a crayfish. And within there, she's able to lay in wait, living off of her stores of nutrients because she's such a successful hunter. And she can stay in there with all her babies, waiting till they get large enough to survive on their own. And then once they're big enough, they will emit a tiny strand of silk and let the wind blow them away. It's called ballooning. 
and it's a way that they can scatter far and wide and not compete with her for resources. Wow, that's such a cool structure, and it's very strong. Stronger than you'd expect. Yeah, Wes is gonna show us how to eat a wood nettle. A leaf. See all these little hairs on the bottom? Yeah. That's what stings you. Right. And if you want to eat them, you have to fold them over so that the little hairs won't touch your mouth. Yeah. So you just fold it over like that. No, you're not. Oh, there he goes. Man. They give you such a colossal sting. So I'm. No, they don't. There's, there's no sting in it. When you're doing this? Oh, well, well, the, the if rake you, is. If yeah. you let the hairs touch you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Man, you are yeah, a brave you, man. You can eat these. Yeah, huh. Huh. And if you take and, like, steam them, yep. you know, boil them like spinach, right. then it takes all the sting out. Well done. They're fine, and they're full of vitamin C. Yeah, so I've heard people make a tea out of it, which is kind of the common way I've thought of, of uh, That's consuming for, nettle. Uh, pulmonary things. Right, or yeah. Breathing and chest problem. This is um, sweet Sicily. Oh, yeah, cool. So, uh, oh, man, that smells so yeah, great. It's mostly, sweet Sicily. What, do you, what would you describe that as? Licorice. Licorice, exactly. It's got a strong licorice smell. If I recall, this is used uh, quite often in French cooking. Never cooked any French people. No. <laughs> you know, when you're not familiar with the plant, you kind of take it and see what it tastes like. Yeah. And if it's really bitter, then, you know, it's nature's way of saying, don't eat don't this. Don't eat this. Yeah. You can't eat that. Yeah. So Justin here is getting some great looks at a damselfly called an orange bluet. You can always tell a damselfly from a dragonfly because when a dragonfly is at rest, it always keeps its powerful gigantic wings straight out. But damselflies, when they land, they will fold their wings behind them. They're extremely powerful organisms and have one of the highest success chances of hunting in the world. Dragonflies are known to have greater than a 90% chance while hunting, putting them in the upper ranks of most successful carnivores in the entire planet. And that makes sense. The first designs for the primitive dragonfly show up in the Carboniferous period. And that is ancient. These are organisms that are older than virtually every type of tree and plant. These are creatures that are contemporaries of ferns and mosses. They show up in the fossil record about 300 million plus years ago. And they've changed very little since then. Of course, they were a lot larger back in the Carboniferous period when there was more oxygen on Earth. Now, how does that work? Well, dragonflies and damselflies and most insects don't breathe at all. They have lines of holes along the side of their body called spiracles. And the oxygen goes into their body passively through transpiration. And so if there's lots of oxygen in the air, that means they can be very big. But if there's not that much oxygen in the air, they have to be small because they can't draw it in like we can, drawing it out of the atmosphere with our diaphragms. Fascinating creatures, and I'm glad we got to get a look at one. You know what this probably was? This wasn't on the trail when we passed, and now he's here, he's still warm, but his neck is broken, so unfortunately this, this little guy is no longer with us. But there are brown-headed cowbirds in the area, which are nest parasites. And what they do is they're gonna lay their egg in the same nest as another organism. And when that baby is born, and I'm talking right as soon as that cow bird is born, it will do like a Hercules press and it will push the other bird out of the nest. And cowbirds are specialists in edge habitats, so areas right on the edge. And so this trail right up against this river is exactly the kind of area where they would like to live. So unfortunately, we've lost this little guy. But cowbirds are natives to this area and they're an important part of the ecosystem. The problem is there's way more cowbirds than there ever have been before. And that's because, think about the world, it's not in huge chunks of wilderness anymore. There are roads and all the bits of wilderness are being chopped up and cut up and that makes a lot more edge than there ever has been before. So, it's an unfortunate victim of the new shape of the planet Earth. Uh, this will be a great meal for a snake and if the snakes don't come along, you'll get ants and you'll get all kinds of detritivores. And so, like I always say, there's no such thing as a disaster in nature. Everything is an incredible boon for something else. Everything is going to thrive off of the misfortune of some other organism. We're all connected in a great cycle. <sighs> all right, well, I guess let's put him right where he was, right where nature intended. Man, we 
cannot go 10 feet on this property without finding something fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, let's ID this before we do anything further. The K is brown snake. Brown snake? Okay, good. So these brown snakes are, um, are fascinating creatures. You see this patterning on it. He's hoping that it will fool us into thinking that he's something more dangerous than he is. And if you see as I move around, he has this, uh, this idea that he wants to strike. And of course, him being non-venomous, uh, his strike won't be dangerous. But look at how he's flaring his ribs. He's doing everything he possibly can to look as large as possible. And of course, this larger organism, he hopes he'll be more threatening. He hopes we'll stay away. The, the brown snake also has the ability to kind of flatten out his head, giving him a further impression of venom. There's that classic delta shape head that we associate with the venomous snake, and by God, he's got it. Now the brown snake is super, super common, and this is a great example. He's probably thriving off of the small toads. This brown snake will absolutely strike and bite, which is why I'm not, you know, letting him crawl through my hands. But of course, being non-venomous, we're not really worried about that. You see that very long, thin tail that he's got. They'll waggle that tail on the ground, and they'll whack dead and drying leaf litter in an attempt to kind of make a noise. And so look at his body, and you see he looks a little bit like the patterning of a timber rattler. Well, combine that with his tail, which is hitting the leaves, making a little tapping noise, he even sounds a bit like a timber rattler. He is doing a great job of mimicking a far more dangerous organism. That is an awesome survival strategy. If you don't have to invest the resources into venom, which is very calorically expensive, then don't do it. As long as there's other timber rattlers that people might confuse you for, then you've got a nice easy life on your hands and you can spend your resources on other things like getting nice and fat like this guy is. Wow, what a cool snake. Let's go, let him go and let's let him go slightly off the path so that nobody steps on him. He might be a fearsome little guy, but nothing's more fearsome than Jakob's size 10 boots. So, <laughs> oh, and he is off like a bullet. All right, well, we'll see you later. Just like that, we're on the edge. We are outside of the old growth forest. We're surrounded on all sides by the influence of humankind. Thank you for coming with us on this voyage into an old growth system, an incredibly rare system, an incredibly important system, full of incredible creatures that live there and nowhere else. Thank you for coming with us. Thank you for coming on this journey. We'll see you on the next one and stay curious. <laughs>